We had Ambassador Lutz yesterday speaking of the decreasing number of Russian soldiers on the Russian border ready to intervene. But when he spoke about them, he spoke about the, the contingent, the, the troops that are staying on, on, on the Russian soil. But when it comes to Ukrainian data, to Ukrainian intelligence, um, our officers say that they see uh, a much more, say, vivid movement of Russians and not the, the, the so-called local militias on the territories of Lugansk and Donetsk. I just wonder whether you could brief us a little bit more on your intelligence on that. I say, well, I, to be honest, I'm not sure I can shed much authoritative uh, light on that. It's certainly the case that Russia has fewer troops on the, its border with Ukraine than it did at the height of the crisis and fighting in August last year uh, and subsequently. But the fact remains that Russia is still actively supporting separatists in those two oblasts. Uh, and that remains a very deep concern for NATO. This is behavior that is totally unacceptable in modern 21st century Europe. Where we go from here, I think, depends very much on what Russia does. What the United Kingdom wants to see is full implementation by all sides of the Minsk agreements. Uh, that requires, in the end, Russia's respect of Ukraine's border. But you see, the main objective, the main goal was to, um, to let the Ukrainians control the border until the December 30, 31st. And there were only three weeks left, and the Minsk doesn't seem to work. Actually, it doesn't work. Uh, so what's next? What do you think of that? I think it's hard to be absolutely sure. Uh, there is a risk that Russia is simply trying to freeze this conflict. Uh, we hope that it will be possible through diplomacy to bring forward movement in the Minsk process, even if the 31 December deadline is not met. What well, could be the next deadline? What do you think? Mm, I hesitate to suggest. I think it's even at this late stage too early to say exactly what the parties to the Minsk agreement are going to be able to agree as next steps. But what NATO suggests, what UK suggests, I mean, okay, you may say that you're an ambassador and a diplomat and this is not your game, but still, this is your game, this is our game, I mean, this is, uh, this is a game for Europe. So what, what if, I, I mean, there should probably be a discussion in NATO headquarters about what to do with Min Minsk if it fails. So what, is there any, any, any proposals from the from the NATO from the United yeah. Kingdom fair question I would say I would expect that ministers uh, tomorrow when the NATO Ukraine Commission meets will discuss with Foreign Minister Klimkin what happens now to the Minsk process but I do need to make clear that NATO as an organization is not a diplomatic player in the Minsk process as such. NATO's job is to provide political support to the Ukrainian government and practical support, for example, on defense reform. The defense reform, uh, the, the summer, it was, it was pretty pot in here. I mean, the Ukrainian defense ministry looked okay. Uh, NATO seemed to, to be more or less satisfied with, uh, with their uh, declarations. But what we see is that, well, one of the projects, the special forces that should be created in Ukraine, it's still a bit, it doesn't work. Difficult. Yeah. So what, yeah. what, what, do you, what do you make of Ukrainian progress? How do you see the Ukrainian progress? Is there is any? Uh, or you should press Ukraine to do more to, to gain some more uh, support? Uh, I think there has been some progress, but the NATO trust funds and NATO engagement have really only been in place for a little more than a year. So it's still quite early days on reform of command and control, cyber, logistics, uh, training is being provided by a number of uh, NATO allies bilaterally. And it's a multi-year task. Ukraine's armed forces have a great deal to do to bring themselves from 
the Soviet era into the 21st century. This isn't going to be easy. It requires both real commitment and a lot of patience, I think. I think you were one of the few diplomats who wrote about Crimea a year after Crimea. But that's, that's very, you know, uh, we loved that in Ukraine. Mm. How do you like the blackout now? Blackout in what sense? Blackout in, in Crimea. How do you like the, the, um, what is happening now? I mean, the Tatars are sort of uh, blocking the, 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 uh, the energy and the, yeah. the, the peninsula itself. Uh, what do you think of those me me measures? Well, I think it's just part of the continuing tragedy of Ukraine after what has been done to it by Russia. For NATO, this was a deeply shocking event. The first annexation of one country's territory by another country since the end of the Second World War. The, the total opposite of everything that NATO has stood for since its creation, and especially since the fall of the Berlin Wall. So it is a, a, a state of affairs that is going to continue to attract focus from not just NATO allies, but from this organization because of what it tells us about the way that Russia regards security in Europe. And that annexation of Crimea has caused NATO to begin to change the way it thinks about preserving security in Europe from top to bottom and side to side of this organization. What's next for Putin? The Bosphorus is closed by Turkey. Sounds good. But what could be what could next step? Well, you uh, would be a valuable man if you could predict uh, or if I could predict and that is one of the things that is most worrying about what President Putin has been doing. It is difficult to predict. There is a lack of transparency. Rus the Russian state lies about its activities. Again, this is the very opposite of what uh, a secure world requires, which is transparency, predictability, and trust. Where we go from here depends very much on Mr. Putin's decisions, but I, and I think many of my colleagues at NATO, fear that he is leading Russia into a dead end economically and politically. And that isn't good for any of us. Yesterday we spoke about ISIS. You spoke about Russian, Russian citizens being uh, uh, sort of... Uh, I tried to provoke you into some, some bit provocative conversation, but, but, but still you mentioned the, the Russian citizens uh, that are part of ISIS. Uh, could you please brief on us a little more on that? about the structure of this uh, rogue state, quasi-state, and about, its, uh, about the Russian role in it. Well, ISIS, ISIS ISIL, Daesh, whatever you call it, uh, is a threat to stability uh, in Europe and around Europe. To some extent, Russia shares those risks. So just as my country worries about our citizens going to Syria, getting training from Daesh and coming back as potential terrorists. So I believe Russia has many thousands, maybe six, seven thousand of its own citizens, Russian citizens, who are now fighting with Daesh in Iraq or Syria. And that must be one of the things that worries Mr. Putin. But still, he's a part of the game, don't you feel so? He, I, I mean, on the other side, he's not bombing ISIS or Daesh. His first concern appears to be, regrettably, to prop up the Assad regime. And by doing so, by putting military force behind Assad, he is backing a regime that is responsible for the most appalling crimes against its own citizens. Putin will have to take some responsibility for that. If he can be brought to see that he needs to join the rest of the world in combating Daesh, ISIL, that would be a valuable step. All right. Thank you, sir. 
we're forced to go. Well, the one thing is, I just wanted to give you a little book that we published with, um, with, the, uh, with our team. This is about war in Ukraine, and it's translated into English. Huh. Uh, this is a story of war reporters uh, on, the, on our side uh, who do the reportage from that's, the war zone. That's yeah, so, uh, very generous of you. Yeah, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. I mean, uh, I just wanted you to have it. Thank you. I uh, will study that with interest. Well, just some, some, some reportage and some personal stories mm. about guys who, mm. who stay on the front. Mm. That, that's it. Thank you.